Hello friends, welcome back to Coding Apops. Today we'll be doing time series forecasting using an LSTM with PyTorch. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. So first we'll do the major imports we have. Panda, Torch, and standard PyTorch imports, data set data borders. And we're going to use a data set uh, called AAPL.csv, which is stock prices of um, Apple the company. Uh, I'll be linking the GitHub repository with the data set so you can download it from there as well. Uh, so let's run the cell. Right now we'll just do data frame.head to see what all attributes we have in this data set. So we have various attributes like symbol, date, close, high, low, open, volume. So for this particular tutorial, I'm just going to use one feature that is a uh, close, a closing value of the stock. Um, you can actually take high, low, or any other, uh, you know, feature which is like varying with time. I uh, means each day it's different. So for this tutorial, we just we just using close. So I'll just take that column from the data frame and uh, store it in a variable called df1. So we just see the contents of df1 here. Now we just plot this content, you know, df1 data using Matplotlib, and we get a graph like this. So this is how we I'll just data stock close price varies uh, due time. Okay, so now uh, we need to normalize this data so that a neural network might do better prediction and it will avoid um, underfitting and overfitting. So we use min max data from sklearn to do it, and we just give the argument for feature range is zero to one, so all our values will be from zero to one, and we'll just fit and transform our input and it will be transformed or normalized to that range. So we can now see our data frame. So it's our array basically. So no data frame. So the values are between zero and one. Now what we need to do is split our uh, data set. Um, so it's different from how we usually split. We cannot randomly split the time series data because information the sequence information is really valuable so what we do is we just um, divide the entire data set by the sum fraction so we're taking 0 0.65 here you can experiment with any other values um, and we're going to just split it into two so the first 65 person will be going to training data and rest of the part of the data set will go to test data so we just run the cell. Okay, so, so now we have our raw data ready. We just need to convert it. We just need to convert it into stock uh, data set class in PyTorch. So we're going to create one named stock data set. And as the constructor, uh, we are inputting sequence length. That's our, and the data set, of course, it means the raw data which we created before. Sequence length is the sequence of um you know sequence of inputs that we're taking across the time frame um 100 is a good value you can also try with different values so then we are converting it into tensors so for any pi torch operations we need to convert it to a tensor so we are using the dot from numpy to convert the numpy array to a tensor uh, now we look the get item method in the data set. So get item gives the x and y values, a single element, when we give an index as an argument. Uh, so what we're going to do is we'll use the index uh, and take a value uh, with our sequence length as an offset. So for example, if the index is one, um, we'll take the data from one to 101 as our x value and we take 102 the next element after the sequence as the output or the y value which we're going to predict and compare to this original y value okay and the length will be self length of self dot data minus self dot sequence length minus one because since we are using sequence of 100 uh, we should subtract this as there will not be any output uh, if like the gap closes at the end of the you know data set. Now after you know defining the class, we create two objects for it. 
for train training and tests, namely test train dataset and test dataset. Okay, so once that is done, now we need to define our data loaders. For data loaders, first we define the batch size, then we call the data loader class with arguments uh, train data set and batch size and drop last equal to true. What this drop last equal to true does is um, the remaining part, like the part last which do not fall into the batch, will be removed. So that's what drop last equal to true gives. Then we'll check whether we have GPU available in our system. I have GPU in my system, so it will be giving CUDA. And if you don't have a GPU, uh, you can uh, use CPU as well, as this is not computationally so much intensive. Okay, we'll be running the cells, it's done. Now we need to define our model, which is main part of this tutorial. So for this, we are taking many parameters as inputs. The input dimension, agent size, and num layers of LSTM. Uh, the first layer is an LSTM layer. Uh, LSTM, the constructor of the LSTM cell, takes an input size. That is the dimension of the input. The hidden size dimension and the number of layers, which basically means how many layers we need to stack uh, about each you know, LSTM. So we can, we are going to give a value which is small. Uh, that'll be three here. You can also try with different stack number of stack layers. And we're gonna take we're, we're gonna do another linear layer after uh, the LSTM to take an output and convert it to a single number, single um, value because our output a Y value is also a single value, so we just need a single value at the end. If you just uh, look at the forward method, you may get it more clearly. We are just calling the LSTM with our input and our cell state. So. LSTM has two cell states, so that is HN and CN. So we're gonna we need to pass it along with our input and final output layer. We just need the output of the final uh, timestamp that is out of minus one. We just need one output uh, that is of the final timestamp. Okay, uh, that's all about the for method. The predict method just predicts the output. Uh, then we'll be using init method. So what this init method does is it will initialize um, our cell state uh, so that we can pass in for our for very first forward call. We can pass it uh, along with that. So that that's what init state does. So you can, if you want to know the dimensions of each of these tensors we need to create, we can very well refer to the PyTorch documentation on LSTM. I will very well link the same page in the description as well. Okay, so now we'll, we'll be defining our hyperparameters like you know, input dimension, uh, hidden size, and num layers. So input dimension is one. Uh, we don't need that's not a hyperparameter actually, uh, because we're just using numbers. So it'll be one most of the times in time series data. Uh, then we are using a hidden size hyperparameter that's 50, a number of layers. We can very well you know, change these and try different values. Um, now we'll be instantiating our model and you know passing the parameters of the model to our device in my case it's cpu it can be a cpu as well okay it might be taking some time as it's converting to gpu it's done great um now we'll be defining our loss function we'll be using mean squared loss and for optimizer we're using adam with this particular learning rate so this is also another parameter you can tweak and try for better results okay yeah so once we define our loss and optimizer functions we are going for our training loop so for our training loop um first we call the model or init method and give get our initial hn and cn cell states uh, then uh, we'll uh, put the model to train state then we we'll start a loop we treat for different back we treat over different batches in the data loader and we get x and y values we pass it to the device then we uh, call the model forward method uh, with x um, the required dimensions and the initial cell state then we find the loss after finding the loss before optimizing this is an important step we need to do that is dot detach method to the cell state because cell state actually is not a parameter of the model and we don't need to update it 
Uh, hence, we j we just removing it from the computational graph by using the dot dash method, and those dot backwards, uh, you know, calculate the gradients. Then we update the values, the uh, parameters. Um, then for after each batch, once it's entered, we'll just print the loss. That's where the training loop. Test loop is pretty similar. We use model dot eval. And we don't need to optimize anything. We just need uh, we just do the same stuff and just find the loss for our uh, validation set. Great. Now, uh, since our test and train loops are ready, we're gonna uh, you know do it for let's just do it for two hundred epochs. And we'll pass, you know, call the train and test function with their respective data loaders. So it's just starting. Since I have a GPU, it's pretty fast. Even if you don't have it, it'll not be so slow. But anyway, I'll get back to you after this is done. That's our total loss and test loss, last train loss and test loss. Now we need to validate our model um, using the entire data set. We'll I just use this helper function called calculate metrics, which just basically do is, um, you know, take the entire data set and uh, use the model for prediction and find the mean square error. Uh, we'll just uh, define that function, then we'll call it for train data loader and test data loader, and we'll Finally, get our full training MSE loss and full test MSE loss here. Okay, that's done. So our training loss is 6.1387, and our, obviously our test loss will be greater. But you can do, you know, try to make it closer by, you know, reducing the training size, maybe changing the batch size, or whatever hyperparameter tuning you can do. So just to see uh, how our how close are our, you know, actual prediction? We just try to print um, prediction array of a random value twenty one, uh, comma twenty one. So we just see for both test and training for our. Train, we can see that this is our actual predicted value and this is the actual value, so it's super close. And for test set as well, there's a difference of just five here. So we are actually doing a scalar inverse transform to transform our, you know, normalized data set to back to its original form here. So that's why you can see the original numbers here. Yeah, so that's it for the tutorial today. Hope you liked it. So please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to like this video. So see you guys in the next video.